Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week live here on a Monday, where for the next 90 minutes we'll be talking gardening and almost nothing but gardening. I'll be talking a little bit about food preservation, but for me, that ties in with gardening because it's all connected. It's so great to have everybody here today. Let's go ahead and start with a question that Drea Young was asking. A new gardener wondering about what vegetables can you grow in the fall season? And coincidentally, I just did a video about this on Saturday. So Drea, be sure and look up the video that just came out on the Gardener Scott channel on Saturday. And the key component is exactly what Monica said in one of the responses to your question. It's all about your first frost date. It doesn't really matter what zone you're in when you're starting plants in summer and growing into fall. Hardiness zones are all about the lowest average winter temperature. And so when you want to grow in fall, you haven't hit your lowest temperatures of winter yet, but you may hit your first frost date. And that makes the difference as to what plants you can grow. And so, for instance, my first frost date here in my zone 5B Colorado Garden is the middle of October. And so right now it's the middle of July. I still have August, September and into October to grow plants. So roughly 90 days. So anything that I start this week needs to be able to grow and reach the point of harvest in 90 days or it needs to be able to slough off any of those cold weather conditions that will hit for me in October. So for you in Philadelphia, for instance, you need to find out your first frost date because that will give you an idea of how much more time you have left to grow. And you might not have time to grow tomatoes, but you might have time to grow a fast growing cucumber or summer squash. You can most definitely grow plants like beets and Swiss chard and spinach, those plants that can handle some freezing conditions. And so even though your first frost might come in October like me, I can grow those kind of plants, those cool season plants into November. And so those are the kind of plants I'm starting and many of you are starting in your garden in early spring. Well, those early spring plants are the same ones that you can grow into the fall in most cases. But check out the video I did on Saturday and I give a long list of the specific plants that you can start, how long they're going to take and whether you can expect success or not. And so it's coincidental that you were asking that question because I've got a 12 minute video that goes much more into depth in it. So hope that helps out. Nice to see so many people checking in. Laura saying squirrels killed all my corn, a four by four food plot. I need to reseed that area with something. And thanks, Jay. Jay's always good for putting links and staying on top of stuff. Uh, and again, same idea. If right now you've got plants that uh, have been eaten by squirrels or anything else, you may have plenty of time to grow complete new crops for harvest in fall. So check out that video and you'd be surprised. It's, it's a long list of things. You can, you can grow the fast growing lettuces and radishes, but you may also have time for cauliflower and broccoli and some of those plants that will typically grow in the spring. And then like some of us had such a, a hot, hot early summer, those spring plants for many of us bolted before we could get a harvest. Well, when you grow into the fall, you're not gonna have that problem with bolting because the temperatures are cooling down as those plants grow. And it's easier for gardeners like me in a region like mine, it's easier often to grow broccoli into the fall than to grow broccoli from spring into the summer. So check that out. Lots of, lots of good options that are still available out there. Phil Schaefer was wondering, can you prep the, some of your vegetables like cucumbers and beets 
in jars with vinegar in the refrigerator a few weeks before canning. Now, some of you know that not only am I a master gardener, but I'm also a master food preserver. Years ago, when I was working with the extension office, there were many weeks where one week I would teach a gardening class and the next week I would teach a food preservation class. And so I'm glad you asked that question, Phil, because hopefully I can answer it for you. And, and I agree with Lar. Lar. Lar suggested exactly what I do. And so, and, and it, it varies by vegetable, but particularly with something like a root crop, like a beet or a carrot. If you're planning on pickling and canning, and I'm assuming water bath canning because you're using a pickling method, I harvest as they're ready and then put them in the refrigerator like Lar suggested and don't really do much more prep than that. And then when you have enough to can, take those out of the refrigerator, mix those with the ones that you've freshly harvested and do some canning. Cucumbers don't work as well if you do something like that. Cucumbers will begin to soften in the refrigerator. So there are many of those kind of vegetables that don't can as well if you save them ahead of time. But tomatoes, you can actually harvest some tomatoes even a little early and have them sitting on your counter. Don't put tomatoes in the refrigerator. And then when you have enough tomatoes, you can can the tomatoes. The issue that you might run into and probably why you haven't found a lot of information on this is that the texture will change and you do open yourself up to some issues with storing the vegetables before you can them if they're not being refrigerated. You really want to, to try to decrease as, as much bacterial action as you can, which is why you put it in the refrigerator. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting them in a vinegar, vinegar solution and then waiting to can them. Now there are different types of recipes. The refrigerator pickles that you apparently have made, those recipes are often different than the pickle recipes that are intended for a water bath canning and sealing and preservation method. So make sure you're using an approved canning recipe. And then I think you'll find more success if you just store the vegetables in the refrigerator and then get to the canning when you have enough. Now, last year I did make pickles and I, I had a video on the fermented pickles. Some of the cucumbers I used had been in the refrigerator and some of the cucumbers I used were from the garden. And so I had a mix of fresh and older refrigerated cucumbers when I made my fermented pickles. They worked fine. There was a noticeable difference. The refrigerator stored cucumbers tended to be softer once they turned into pickles than the fresh cucumbers. And that's one reason why it's best to get everything fresh and can it all at once. But you can still do that. I, I wouldn't necessarily say put it in a vinegar solution and then can it. Now you could use a, 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 a recipe for canning. And it's often a one-to-one -one vinegar to water ratio with some salt and maybe some sugar and then your spices. You can go ahead and boil up that solution, put your cucumbers in the jar, in that solution, in the refrigerator, and then when it comes time to do all of your canning, you can take those jars, put them in your water bath canner and seal the jars but you're going to see a difference in texture because they will have been sitting in that, that uh, vinegar mix for a week or two before they're canned and haven't done that, but it may be something that you can try to see if you don't mind the texture, but you can definitely do it with the root vegetables. I've done it many times without any issues at all. So uh, hopefully that helps out a little bit. Kevin is saying, I've got about six pints of tomato sauce made from my mountain vineyard grape tomatoes. I score and freeze to make peeling easier on those little guys. Great tasting tomato. Good. I haven't grown those kind of tomatoes, but that's a good point. Uh, if you're peeling tomatoes uh, for canning purposes, that's often difficult to do. What I do is uh, take the tomatoes, score them, put an X on the 
the flour in. I'll drop them in a pot of simmering water for about a minute and then take them out of that pot, immediately put them into a bath of ice water and then the skin usually peels off pretty well. But the, the freezing is also another great way. If you put them in the, in the freezer, uh, same idea. It, just like I do with the ice bath. That helps to, to, to peel off the, the skins on those tomatoes. So thanks for that tip. That's always a nice idea. Uh, and so Yvonne is wondering, I planted pickle bush cucumbers. Is that only for pickling? Not at all. And so cucumbers uh, come in two different sizes, basically. You've got your pickling cucumbers and your slicing cucumbers. And you can use them interchangeably. If you want to use pickling cucumbers in a salad, go for it. If you want to use slicing cucumbers as a pickle, go for it. They, they, t they do have different density in their flesh. And so the pickling cucumbers the smaller ones tend to be more dense. And so when you make pickles out of them, they will be firmer pickles. And if you slice them up and put them into a salad, they will be denser. They won't be quite as juicy as a slicing cucumber. I like to use slicing cucumbers, like the, a straight eight or a market more. Those are the two varieties that I tend to grow. I use those for refrigerator pickles. They don't do well when you you water bath can them because the heat will actually soften them quite a bit. But I think they're great for refrigerator pickles. So uh, they are interchangeable and there are a lot of different options that, that you can do. I've got Boston pickling cucumbers uh, in my garden right now. That's the, the pickle variety that I'm growing for the purpose of making pickles. But um, experiment a little bit, Yvonne, look out at some other varieties and, and decide whether your primary purpose is pickling and whether it's going to be water bath canning or refrigerator pickling and whether you also want some cucumbers for things like salads or, or relish trays. And, and there's just a ton out there to choose from. Julia is saying, good morning from Blue Lake, California. Good morning to you. Thank you, Gardener Scott. Ordered a growing tower entirely because of your video. I'll save a lot of growing space by uh, for strawberries in there. Um, thanks. I'm glad you did that, Jerry or Julie. I'm glad that uh, you liked that. Uh, the video I did earlier last week was all about the uh, the the new green stock vertical garden system. They've got one called the Leaf System, which has uh, shallower tiers so you can actually grow more plants in the same space. I've had the original green stock system for uh, a couple years now and really like it but I tend to grow a lot of salad crops in my green stock so I don't need a deep rooted container and and the original green stock is 10 inches deep and so this new system each of the tiers each of the little pots is only seven inches deep and so I'm really looking forward to to using that and that's what I did the video about this last week and I'm going to be doing strawberries too I've had a lot of questions in the last week from that video about if you can grow strawberries in it you can definitely grow strawberries in the green stock systems uh, much depends on the the zone now is where the hardiness zone comes in and how cold your winters get as to whether the strawberries will overwinter and I haven't tried that before. So in my new system, the green stock tower, I'll be growing some strawberries to experiment if they can grow in my zone five garden in that container. Now I've got strawberries that do great. They come back every year. You can grow strawberries in zone five with no problem. But in a container, there are some other considerations and the whole container will free solid and just like my whole ground freezes solid it's not that much of uh, that's not really the big issue more it's the issue of the soil moisture in containers when we have plants we tend to forget them during the winter and so the soil dries out and gets dry as a bone and then if you get snow the snow might rest on the top of that pot and the amount of moisture in snow is much less than the moisture in rain. So for instance, it's about 
and in if you get a two inch snowfall then you're only getting 0.2 inches of precipitation and so a lot of gardeners who are growing in containers and see snow in their containers over the winter assume that that's enough to keep the soil moist and keep those plants alive well the the few times i've grown strawberries in containers i didn't do much supplemental watering and the last test i did i didn't do any watering and none of the strawberries made it through the winter because the soil just dried out to the point that it desiccated the roots and so then when everything warmed up in spring the plant was dead so this year with the green stock vertical planter i'll have some strawberries and i will make a point to water through the winter to keep the soil moist until it freezes and then even after it freezes on warm days typically when it warms up above 40 degrees in the winter that's about four and a half degrees celsius you'll want to water your your beds particularly your containers so you'll probably see this on a video next year where i'll be talking about how my strawberries in the green stock did and how i did the watering to keep them alive so uh, i'm glad you're thinking along those lines as well julie it might be something that you can definitely have some fun with and and learn a little bit about strawberries along the way today i wanted to try to focus on some gardening secrets and i'll share with you some of the ideas i have and i encourage you if you've got a tip if you've got something that you've found works really well for you in your garden share it with us today because those are the kind of things that that many of us could learn from other gardeners i continually learn from you and other channels and other people i know when it comes to gardening and so that's that's the basic theme of today is to talk about some of the secrets we all have including me when it comes to gardening okay let's start with the first one that i wanted to talk about um one of the things and 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 i say this is a secret because i didn't figure this out for a long time uh, after i started gardening when we grow a plant everything we've already talked about to this point we are typically growing it for a specific purpose a specific harvest so for instance beets uh, in this in the earlier discussion we were talking about pickling beets and i grow beets primarily to pickle and so so many of us will grow beets for the purpose of pickling we'll harvest the beet we'll chop off the leaves and then we'll process the beet for pickling well those leaves are edible and delicious and can also be used in your kitchen and that's one of those secrets that too many of us don't become aware of many of the plants we're growing in our vegetable garden can be eaten top to bottom and so think about that as an option if you're growing a particular plant because you like it for the root we'll do a little bit of investigation you may find out that the leaves are also edible turnips is another great example I grow turnips for the root, but turnip greens can be sauteed with a little bit of onion and garlic, and it's a delicious side dish to have with your dinner. There are so many of those kind of things that we just don't think about. And hopefully, if you are cutting off the leaves, you're throwing them in your compost pile because all of the stuff you don't use in your garden is is great to turn into compost but start thinking about some of those other things you can do there are a lot of herbs that we use that that can serve two purposes dill i love dill dill's a great plant for attracting beneficial insects and i'll harvest the leaves of the dill and i'll use those leaves to make tartar sauce when i'm doing fish or mix it with some butter and have a a dill butter sauce over a nice grilled fish oh, doesn't that sound good but if you allow the dill to continue growing and flower and those flowers turn into seeds dill seed is also an, another great seasoning another great thing you can add to sauces and it's a completely different flavor than those leaves subtly different but it is different cilantro 
Another example, I grow cilantro primarily for the leaves. And I'll take my cilantro leaves and make salsa with my tomatoes and onions and garlic. But if you allow the cilantro to continue growing to flower and seed, those seeds now become coriander. And so if you use coriander in your cooking, you can get your own coriander by just growing cilantro seeds. And so we, we focus so often on one aspect of a plant. And by just spreading our wings a little bit in the garden, we can get so much more from what we're growing. When you're growing a squash, particularly a, a pumpkin that has a really large flower. So a pumpkin flower, a zucchini flower, those are edible completely edible and they have a really nice flavor. And so if you've got a squash plant in your garden like zucchini, and typically you're going to have more male flowers than female flowers, and those male flowers are going to start blooming before the female flowers show up, you can let them flower and then they'll fade and then they'll shrivel and fall down onto the soil. Or you can cut off those flowers that are not yet being used for pollination and stuff it and cook it. And so there are a ton of recipes out there for stuffed squash flowers or stuffed pumpkin flowers. And typically it's, it's often a meat based mix that you put into the flour and then you bake it. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to have some variety in your kitchen and use a flower that you never thought about being edible. So there's a secret. Learn about the other aspects of the plants you're growing and see if you can get some new harvests that you never even thought about before. So let's see what else we have. Rachel saying, borage has also become a major component in my compost tea. It is in the comfrey family. Uh, borage is great. I think I saw Frank uh, and Samo check on and and he recently shared some pictures with us uh, about his borage. My borage is doing great. I love borage. It's a great plant. It, it attracts a lot of really beneficial insects. It has a really nice flavor. You can use the leaves, almost cucumbery um, in, uh, in, in like a salad. The flowers are also edible, but you're exactly right. It is also something that you can use in, in a homemade fertilizer. You can throw it in your compost pile, which I'll do after the flowers fade eight later in the season. Um, but I have a video, an older video, that shows how I make a comfrey tea fertilizer. You can do the same thing using borage for the same reason. Those leaves are packed with nutrients. So thanks for sharing that, Rachel. That's a nice idea. I, borage is just such a wonderful plant and flowers, and so few gardeners grow it. And it's, uh, even if you just grow it just to look at, it's a, I think it's a beautiful plant. The leaves have a really unique color and texture to them. And then it's got kind of a deep blue flower that is just beautiful in the garden. Oh, and by the way, you can eat the whole thing. So that's kind of some of the ideas that we're talking about in getting things out there. Thanks, Kevin. My biggest gardening secret is watching Gardener Scott. Not much of a secret considering how often I use the phrase Gardner Scott said. That's, that's good. I appreciate that, Kevin. Thanks so much. Uh, Taco Promotions is saying, uh, love my amaranth. It grows so wild I use it for chop and drop. Amaranth is another one of those that, that um, does great. I'm growing a purple amaranth right now. And so here, here's another one of those secrets when it comes to uh, the plants that we will grow for one purpose, but we can use it for another purpose. Amaranth is great for the insects. Uh, it's great for leaving in the garden and let it go to seed and the birds will eat it. It's a great uh, food for the, the birds. It's also great to add to the compost pile. But did you know that you can take the amaranth seeds and cook them like you would popcorn and it's a nice little snack. And so uh, if, if you've had uh, the, the baked or roasted amaranth seeds let me know in the comments but that's another one of those plants that you can cook the seeds and if you really want to get into it you can make a flour out of the amaranth seeds and bake bread from your amaranth seeds so there's just so many hidden secrets in the plants that we grow if you look for them because there's 
other ways you can use those plants. Uh, yeah, there you go. Frank is saying I have amaranth every morning in my oatmeal. There you go. So did you ever think about growing amaranth to eat? I bet you didn't. And so that's what today's all about is these little secrets that just pop up when we don't even know it's something we should be thinking about. So, uh, Jay, I appreciate that. As a reminder, uh, Jay and, and Heidi, the moderators that are on, do a great job of helping to answer the question. And I know a lot of you are out there answering the questions as well. And there's just such a good group of both brand new beginning gardeners. A lot of you are asking questions, which is awesome. And then there's so many of you in this Gardener Scott community that are more experienced and answer questions. And and I'll use um, Heidi as an example, for instance. JD does or Heidi does a great job of answering questions, but Heidi asks me questions all the time. And I consider her uh, an expert gardener in many respects. I know she doesn't necessarily consider herself a, an expert gardener, and Jay's the same way. Jay knows a ton about gardening, but Jay it doesn't hesitate to ask questions when Jay has an area that she doesn't know about. And so don't, don't feel like you're alone out there. If there's an area of gardening you don't know about, all of us have areas of gardening that we don't know about, even if we're answering questions and sharing our experience and all the rest that we have going up. Okay, Paul's asking, any tips on keeping bugs off my red cabbage? I'm not going to get any heads, they're all full of holes. And so there's a couple things to think about when, like with cabbage for instance, uh, or, or any leafy crop that you're growing for the purpose of eating the leaf. First off, try to find out what kind of insect it is because then you can target any corrective action. And so one of the solutions that I, I showed uh, in the springtime with some of those salad crops I was growing is to cover the whole bed with a row cover or a fine mesh fabric so that insects can't get to the plants to eat them in the first place. And so covering is often a great solution, especially for a cabbage, because you don't need the flowers. You don't need pollination to harvest kale or spinach or cabbage or or any of the root crops that we're growing so you can cover the whole bed and keep the insects out that's one great way to do it or if you can find out what kind of insect it is you may find that it overwinters in the soil or it overwinters in the dead plants and so when you find out about the life cycle of those plants if it's an insect that overwinters inside the the stems of the plant well, then you pull your plants in fall, throw them in a compost pile, and you won't have those insects in that bed the next year. Those are the kind of things you can do. Attracting the beneficials like the ladybugs and the lace wings and the mantids, all of those uh, insects are attracted to the garden with different plants. There are dozens of wasp species that are attracted to the garden with plants like fennel and dill. There are many flowers that are attracting some of these predatory beneficial insects. So increase the variety of your plantings to bring in the good bugs, learn what kind of bad bugs you, bug, bad pugs you have. And often with a sturdy plant like cabbage, if it's an aphid problem, or if it's a white fly problem, or if it's a flea beetle problem, one of those little insects, often a strong spray of water is enough to knock off those little bugs and damage or kill them. And so it could be as simple as just spraying your cabbage every day and you'll see a decrease. But do realize for those of us who are growing organically, often our plants are gonna look ugly. We tend to think that everything we grow should look exactly like what we see in the supermarket. Well, the stuff that's being grown in the supermarket is often a hybrid that is being grown to look pretty, not necessarily taste good. Uh, and it might be a, 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 a producer that's using a lot of chemicals to kill all the bad bugs. And so you've got that to deal with. And when you grow it in your own garden, you're gonna have holes in the leaves and some of the fruit might not look as pretty, but it's all definitely going to taste better. And so it's 
I don't mind making a salad with some leaves that have a few holes in them. You know, as, as long as you wash it off and make sure there's no bugs in your salad, it's, it's usually all good. So uh, don't be afraid of having some leaves in your uh, salads that, that have holes in them. If you're growing something like kale or spinach or cabbage that you might cook, well, it doesn't matter if it's got holes in it or not, because by the time you cook it, you're not going to be able to see those holes. So do try to deal with the pests, whatever it might be, but don't worry too much about how pretty the plant looks if it's got holes in it. It's one of those kind of things that you just kind of have to um, accept and deal with it. Okay, let's see. Jay is answering, looks like answering um, Colorado Bird Nerd. You can look close to identify the plant and use organic methods to limit damage. There you go. Um, beneficial insects, bacillus thuringiensis, water spray, crushing, diatomaceous earth. Um, I have a recent videos where I talk a lot about uh, that kind of stuff. So thanks, Jay, for answering that question. Love always, Jasmine. Hello again on a Monday. Hi there. I feel so overwhelmed with squash bugs and vine borers. Do they ever leave? Yes, and that's exactly um, the point. You've got to figure out the type of insect you have. So it looks like you've identified squash bugs and vine borers. And so vine borers are a perfect example of an insect that will overwinter in your garden and it will overwinter in your bed. And so depending on the specific type of borer, some borers will overwinter in the plant refuse and some borers will overwinter in the soil. And so for those that are overwintering in the plants, like I said, throw them in your compost pile, or if it's a really bad infestation, get rid of the plants, uh, but disrupt the soil. The, the, the soil, many of us are, are of a mindset that once we get our, our soil established, we really shouldn't do anything to it. We shouldn't dig in it because we're going to disrupt the soil life to include earthworms. And I do agree with that. You shouldn't be tilling your soil once you get it nice and healthy. You just add organic matter to it. Now, Charles Dowding with his no dig method is probably the most recognized for not doing any digging or tilling. He just adds a couple inches of compost on top of the soil each year and that helps replenish the soil. And that works great, unless you have a pest that digs into the soil and overwinters in the soil. And by just turning the soil, by just bringing a little hand cultivator in and, and moving the soil around in spring, that's often enough to disrupt the larva in the soil and you can get rid of a pest like a borer because you've disrupted their their winter growing space, and you've exposed them now to the birds. And, and you'll see this often if you have a mulch pile or a chip pile, that when you dig in it, you'll see grubs that are growing, little beetle grubs. It's the same basic idea. You have these larvae that are living in the soil. And so if you want to add compost to your bed in spring, do it and turn it into the soil, and that's often enough to get rid of some of those borer problems uh, that, that you could potentially have. Squash bugs tend to be a little more difficult to get rid of, but they're, most of the squash bugs are going to overwinter. They're gonna lay eggs and overwinter in the, the squash vines and leaves. So get rid of those out of your garden. Throw them into the compost pile and make sure they're composted before you you uh, use any of that again, throw them away if it's a really bad infestation. But if you can get rid of the eggs and you can get rid of the larva of these pests, then that's how you get rid of them. And it may take a year, it may take a couple years. I was in my garden this morning and I saw a harlequin bug, the first harlequin bug I've seen in this garden. So I'm going to be on the lookout. I, I grabbed it, I tried to squish it, it fell down. So I'm gonna go back when I'm done here and, Try to find it and squish it and kill it so it doesn't establish uh, a harlequin bug infestation in my garden. But those are the kind of things you do. You just got to stay on top of it. Squash bugs, you see a squash bug, pick it and squish it or pick it and drop it in soapy water. Do whatever you can, but you got to try to stay on top of it to uh, reduce the possibility that you'll have a problem later on. 
So hope that helps. Okay, let's see. Browning's Homestead is asking, how do you transition into fall gardening? Do you allow your current plants to die back or end them early to get your fall plants in? Um, good question. And I touched a little bit about that in, in the video that I released on Saturday. Um, I also have some fall planting videos that I did last year where I talk about this much more in depth. Uh, but it depends. It depends on the plant. So for instance, um, the the... The potatoes and the garlic that are probably being harvested by most of us right now. Those are plants that you can schedule, you can plan for. You know you're going to be harvesting those plants in July or August in midsummer. And then you can take those beds that you know are going to be empty and go ahead and start planting a fall crop. Uh, my garlic I harvested last week and I got the seeds and so that bed is getting ready to grow into fall. But I'll use potatoes as, a, as an example. I, I can harvest my potatoes now if I choose to, or I can wait probably another three weeks or four weeks to harvest my mid-season potatoes. But if the plants I want to grow into the fall have a higher priority because maybe my season isn't long enough, like we talked about earlier, then I can go ahead and, and harvest those potatoes. They'll be young potatoes. They won't be fully formed tubers. But yes, I have that option to go ahead and harvest potatoes early and then plant in those same grow bags or beds a fall crop. Or when you start seeing some of your spring crops that uh, have started to bolt. So for instance, I still have some lettuces growing under shade cloth in my garden. Well, I can try to get another couple weeks of that lettuce, but it reaches a point where it's kind of at the end of its life cycle and the, the flavors will begin to change in those salad crops as they age. So the smart thing to do, and actually what I'm going to do in my main salad crop bed is to pull out all those plants. So some of those those brassicas that still haven't given me, given me a harvest yet, rather than just try to struggle through the heat of summer and hope for a harvest of those brassicas, I'm just gonna pull them out. And some of the, the turnips that uh, I'm growing, I'm gonna be harvesting turnips, but some of them have gone to seed. They bolted in the heat. Another good example, I'm gonna pull all the turnips. Some I'll be able to use, some aren't quite big enough for my intended purpose, but I can still use them and some have bolted. Time to clear out that bed and just sacrifice the plants that didn't do as well as I had hoped to put in some new plants going into the fall. You'll, you'll see that with cucumbers, for instance. Cucumbers typically really start to fade later in the season. And so the cucumber plants I'm growing right now, I'm expecting a great harvest in August, but they're probably going to just really cut back on the flowers and the fruiting at the end of August and beginning of September for me in my garden. Well, rather than keeping those cucumbers in the ground, hoping that a couple more flowers might appear and I might get a couple more cucumbers and inevitably a frost comes and those last cucumbers end up dying on the vine anyway. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pull those cucumber plants once the plants have hit the peak of their production. When they start fading, I'll pull out those cucumber plants and I will still have time to grow radishes and lettuce and spinach and those plants that can handle when the first frost hits. So to answer your question, a lot of it depends on what you're hoping to get from your fall garden and how much extra effort you're putting into plants that are growing right now that really aren't going to give you much payback. And so when I say prioritize, it's kind of the payback. What are you getting from the plants right now? And will you get more if you pull those plants that are grow growing right now? <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have. Um, before I forget, um, because I forgot a couple weeks ago, 
Yeah, let me scroll up and catch up. <coughs> oh, Yankee Sista, thank you so much. I appreciate that super chat. Thanks. It's always nice to see you here. So happy summer veggies finally starting to trickle in. That's great. Uh, yeah, I've got some tomatoes that are just starting to form. I got peppers that are forming. Uh, I haven't harvested any of those yet, but I, um, it's so nice to, to have the summer harvest coming in. So I'm glad to, to see that. Glad to hear it. Thanks for being here. Um, so anyway, the point I was just about to make so that I don't forget is the background today. And so this background picture comes from Brian Sabert. And this is Brian's garden. I think it's a beautiful garden. I'll point out some of the things that I saw in this garden that I think are, are great ideas that maybe you can carry on into your gardening. And there's one of my secrets. I've shared this a lot. Steal ideas from other gardeners. Don't think that when you garden, you have to garden based on the way you read it in Charles Dowding's book or the way you read it in anybody else's book or the way you saw it on a video channel. Steal ideas from lots of different gardeners to figure out what works best for you. And so as I look at Brian's garden here, let me go ahead and point out right here. So this is an archway. And I have a similar archway that, that I have in my garden. If you look at the plants uh, just above my head right here, you can see a gourd. So he's got gourds growing over the archway. Now, what I did with my arch is I built some really nice raised wooden beds and I have my arches coming out of those beds. Well, look what Brian did. He's got straw bales right here. And so he's growing his plants in straw bales uh, and, and straw bale gardening is a definite option you can use. And he's got the arches in the straw bales growing up. And, and I think the, the gourds actually look beautiful. There's, I think that's probably an orich plant right there. Another great salad crop that you can grow. It, it's got the flowers to attract the pollinators. What a great idea. And so you don't have to do just one thing. You can, you can mix and match. And so I did a video last year on straw bale gardening and, and had some success with it. And you may have been wanting to try straw bale gardening for the first time or again. Well, think about putting a cattle panel arch in your straw bales and you can grow that anywhere in your space. That's one of the big advantages of straw bale gardening is you can do it anywhere. And so if you're doing a vining plant, put an arch or a trellis out of your straw bales and you can do it in a back corner. You can do it in the middle of your yard. You can do it anywhere. You don't have to construct raised beds to get the same benefit. So great idea. And then when you look up here, you see how he's got this really nice trellis system. And then at the top of it, he's got shade cloth over the plants. Uh, another great idea to have the uh, it looks like a relatively permanent structure, but to protect all of these plants, all the tomatoes and all the other plants he's growing in there, he's got shade cloth across the top, which we've talked a lot about in the live streams to be able to grow in the summer and keep some of those temperatures down. And then all around, if you look over on this side, you can see he's got um, some shorter raised beds. He's also got uh, looks like a, a fabric cover to keep insects off the plants. And so a lot of the stuff we've already talked about today, Brian's doing in his garden. So uh, I think it's a beautiful garden. I, I thank you, Brian, for sharing. If you look just behind me, you'll see some other shorter trellises with his plants growing right here. And it looks like in the distance, there might be some tomatoes growing again underneath this trellis with shade cloth. And so a lot of work went into this garden. It's beautiful. I, I appreciate you sharing the picture, but lots of good ideas for the rest of us to use in our gardens. And that's one reason why I like to use the background photos from you, because I try all kinds of new things in my garden. I try to make a video about all of the different things I'm doing in my garden, but I always learn something from your videos and your gardens because we all have the unique garden spaces and we all have ideas of what works best for us which is why 
I, I asked you to share some of your tips today in this session of Gardening Secrets because there are things that some of us are doing that no one else knows about. And so using this example of using a straw bale garden to support an archway, where else have you seen that? So think of that as a secret that we've now shared with you that you might be able to use in your garden space. So I don't think of secrets as something that is information we're hiding. You know, it's not like the, the secret formula of Coca-Cola that they keep under lock and key. No, gardening secrets are just things we haven't discovered yet. And most of us are more than willing to share these tips and ideas to others. And then it's no longer secret. Now it's a great gardening idea that the rest of us can, can share. And it may be something you discovered, might be something you developed, it might be something that you just became an expert doing because it works best for your garden. So share those secrets and continue sharing them as we continue on. Hardy or Heidi is saying potatoes that are green should not be eaten. Um, that's a good tip. I forget the name of that chemical um, that is in the green when the peel is green, the outer part of the, the potato is green. If you're growing potatoes and they are exposed to light, that's what causes that that enzyme or that chemical to activate and so in your garden look for that when you're harvesting your potatoes thanks for pointing that out heidi that's one of those things that you really shouldn't eat green potatoes um, because of whatever that chemical is i'm sure some one of you out there can tell me what that happens to be pd good to see you here today good morning to you and all the other global gardeners from sunny and human northern virginia Sorry, missed out on the earlier portion of the chat. Nope, no problem. Uh, and we say this all the time. You can always catch up right now. You can click on the beginning of the chat and watch it again. We'll be talking different stuff. Um, but yeah, if you want to participate in the chat live, stick with us from this point forward and watch it in replay. Or as we finish, just click from the beginning and you'll be caught up uh, once, you, once you finish with what we're talking about. Okay, there you go. So um, the boring gardener is saying solanine. Frank is saying solamine. Um, Jay is saying solanine. Um, so there you have it. That's the name of the chemical that's in the potatoes. And uh, and you'll see that even in the pantry. If, if you've got potatoes on your counter or in a pantry that is exposed to light, the potatoes will turn green. And it's that chemical that's reacting to it. So I appreciate that. Good morning to you, Gail. Nice to have you here today. Ultimate Gardening, nice to see you back as well. Um, we talked about Ultimate Gardening's channel, a, a youngster who's involved with gardening and making YouTube videos, which I think is just incredible. And so I'll give a shout out to Ultimate Gardening and suggest you go check out his channel. For a 14 year old gardener making videos, I was impressed. So check out some of what he's got just starting out. Uh, but there, there's some good videos and uh, I look forward to seeing more from you. So glad you're here today. It's nice to have you participating. So good. Um, and thanks so much for all this great information that's coming out, talking about green potatoes and the chemicals. Um, thanks, Paul, for sharing that uh, in the um, Solanum um, family of plants. It's nice to know that. And, and again, this is where I learn. I, I know about potatoes turning green and that there's a chemical and that you shouldn't eat it, but look at how much information this community has to share the actual scientific aspect of it. So that's incredible. You guys are just so awesome. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um, and so uh, Melissa's asking, do tomatoes also make the solanine? And so I think um, yes and no. Uh, and so uh, some of you, maybe Paul, if you've got better uh, information about this. And so tomatoes and potatoes are in the same family. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know for sure that tomatoes will also make that. Um, but there's a key difference in that the potatoes are tubers underground. And so the light causes that chemical to activate. Whereas the tomato fruit is grown above ground 
and the, the light is part of its normal growth cycle. So the light is not going to activate that harmful chemical in tomatoes like it would in potatoes. But I'm guessing there is some aspect to tomatoes that that chemical might be in the background or it might be part of uh, a leaf or a stem. I, I don't know for sure. It's just purely a guess just because the plants are closely related. So don't worry about sun activation on your tomatoes. That's not going to make them toxic. In fact, that's what we want. We want the sun on our plants. You don't want too much sun on the individual fruit. Tomatoes can get sun scald. It's a little white or yellow spot. It, actually, it can actually be quite large if the fruit is exposed to the direct sunlight. <clears throat> and so that is something to look out for about too much sun on the tomatoes. But I wouldn't worry about that particular chemical. Okay, uh, let's see. There was something else. Oh, I wanted to, um, to talk a little bit when we're talking about our gardening secrets and the things that that work for us best. And so th this, this gets back to the idea I bring up uh, often about keeping a garden journal and that it's a good way for you to track what does best in your garden. And so you could consider a garden journal a secret because most gardeners don't keep a journal. And those that do tend to have better gardeners or gardens. So those gardeners have cracked the code. They've figured out the secret to successful gardens is to keep track of what you were doing so that you can repeat what works best and not repeat what doesn't work. But one of the issues in growing in our gardens and why I say keeping track is important is because each of our gardens is unique. Each of our gardens can grow certain plants better than a gardener maybe 15, 20 miles away, definitely different from a garden in a completely different country or region of your country. And so I'll use tomatoes as an example. So this next week, the forecast for my garden is for the daytime temperatures <coughs> to be about 81 degrees, give or take a little bit Fahrenheit. That's about 27 degrees Celsius. And the nighttime temperatures are going to be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius. Those conditions are perfect, ideal for growing tomatoes. And so this next week, these next couple weeks, I'm anticipating that my tomatoes, which are doing pretty well right now, are going to do great. They're going to grow quickly. I'm going to get a lot of flowers and I'm going to get a lot of fruit on those flowers because right now in my garden conditions are ideal for tomatoes. But I'll share with you my brother who lives in Arizona. He's not growing tomatoes right now because he's expecting temperatures of about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius during the day, much too hot for tomatoes. And so as gardeners, we'll often want to grow tomatoes in our garden. And I, on a couple of videos, have suggested tomatoes as a plant you should be growing in your garden. But the secret is you have to know when to grow the different plants to get that success. So my brother is not growing tomatoes in July, but he can grow tomatoes in October when things start cooling down and he gets to that point where his temperatures in southern Arizona are matching what my temperatures are like right now. And I can grow my tomatoes in July, but I can't grow my tomatoes in October because it just gets too cold. And so think of that as a secret because it's a correlation that we don't often uh, connect, especially as a new gardener, that the temperatures and the length of our growing season makes a difference in what we grow and how well it does. And so using, uh, again, this, this photo behind me with the gourds. And so I've grown gourds. Those look like birdhouse gourds. I've grown birdhouse gourds, but I have to do it perfectly to have success. Most birdhouse gourds are going to take 100 to 120 days to harvest. And that's after the plant is growing. 
So for me to grow birdhouse gourds, I either have to start the seed ahead of time and then put a plant in the garden. And from that point, I've got 100 to 120 days, which is pretty close to the length of my growing season. And I'm usually harvesting those gourds the week before my first frost hits. So I can grow those gourds, but I'm squeezing it in and everything has to work perfectly in my garden. If you want to grow birdhouse gourds and you've got a very short growing season, well, you might not be able to do it ever at all, unless you grow them in a greenhouse. There are many other plants that fall into that category. Okra, for instance, I saw someone comment earlier that their okra was as tall as they are. I'm growing okra right now. Well, my okra is still very small. And I've said this before, okra is one of those plants I have a hard time growing because my conditions just aren't right. It's not hot enough and my season doesn't tend to be long enough when the heat comes. And so lots of people growing okra, you might already be harvesting it. Whereas mine, again, I'm probably not going to get a harvest because the plants just aren't growing that quickly. So learn those kind of things. Learn what plants do best in your region, specifically in your garden, and focus on those plants, becoming an expert on those plants. And then learn what plants really don't do well in your garden. And rather than beating your head against the wall, trying to grow a plant that will never do well, just write it off and, and acknowledge. There are some plants some of us can't grow in our gardens. It's just as simple as that. Uh, Mage Grey Wolf at, uh, at the very beginning was talking about sugar cane. In zone 10, you can grow sugar cane. In zone five, you can't grow sugar cane. Now I might be able to start it indoors and put it outside and then move it into a greenhouse later in the season. I was able to find a single variety that is good down to zone six of sugar cane that can overwinter. But I'm not trying to grow sugar cane because it's too much work and I know it's not gonna work unless I'm growing that one variety and everything goes perfectly. But if I lived in zone 10, sure, I'd be trying sugar cane too. But in zone 10, you can't grow apple trees. Apple trees require vernalization. They require cold temperatures in winter to get fruit. That's why apple trees are being grown in Washington and not Florida. Same reason why grapefruit trees are being grown in Florida and not in Washington. So don't feel bad if you can't grow some things that you want to grow. It just might not match with your particular garden. But when you learn how everything fits together between the soil temperature, the air temperature, the length of the season, the last frost, the first frost, and the plants that you want to grow, that's the secret to success. That's the secret to putting all the pieces together and then having the harvest that you're looking for. And I'm just thrilled with the forecast this week for my garden because I just I, last year I didn't get the tomatoes I wanted because of hailstorms early and hailstorms late and because of hot temperatures that were too hot during the summer. It's all coming together right now. And I'm, I'm just going to have a, a beautiful tomato harvest. I'm anticipating it. It's, it's awesome. Okay, let's see. Sheena's Keto Prepared uh, Homestead is saying you can get hybrids that have a shorter growth time. Um, yeah, good point. There, You can also get some heirloom varieties of different types of plants that have short growing periods as well. But but that's, that's, a, that's a good uh, tip that if you are dealing with a shorter growing season or like we're talking about fall planting where you put something in in July to grow into the fall, short season plants, shorter growing season plants tend to do better. And you're exactly right. There are many hybrids that you can find that are specifically developed to be able to grow quickly in a shorter amount of time. And as I've said before, I haven't talked about this in a month or two probably, but uh, add hybrids to your mix. Hybrids often get a bad rap, uh, especially with the increase in the awareness of heirloom varieties in recent years. There are many gardeners that think you can, you can only have an organic garden if you're growing heirloom open pollinated plants. And that's not true. You can have an organic garden and grow hybrid plants. Hybrids are just a plant that was developed using uh, the, the pollen from one male parent 
and or one the male pollen from one parent and the female pollen from a different parent and it develops into uh, a plant that has different characteristics than the parent plants and if you really think about it everything we grow in our garden at one time was a hybrid it, it's that simple if you trace back the history of tomato plants you'll find that tomatoes are believed to have originated in Central America and it was basically the size of a small berry and then over the centuries those plants be were pollinated by different types of tomato plants and produced a hybrid and maybe that hybrid had a larger fruit and over time as plants naturally pollinate themselves in nature hybrids develop and at some point a gardener discovers that plant saves the seed and then stabilizes that seed so that it's no longer a hybrid and those characteristics stay true to the plant and so all the all the wonderful tomatoes that we grow these days that are heirloom they didn't exist a few hundred years ago you might be able to find some tomatoes from the late 1800s you'll be able to find quite a few tomatoes from the early 20th century but even the heirlooms a lot of the heirlooms that we're growing have only been around for about 50 years before that point they were a hybrid and then they had some stable characteristics that enabled them to be reproduced as an open pollinated or heirloom plant. And so as we're growing in our garden, particularly into the fall, yes, your point is exactly right. Hybrids may be the answer for you to be able to get those additional crops going into the fall. Okay, let's see. LP says, I'm just fascinated by the enormous variety of plants available to us. I don't think I can resist hybrids. And I completely agree. I, I like growing primarily the open pollinated heirloom varieties so that I can save the seed and grow that plant again. But I've got um, um, sun glow, sun peach, um, sun, uh, I can't remember. I'm growing like four different types of sun varieties of tomato and they're all hybrids. Uh, and so uh, to get some of the delicious tomatoes in particular, you're going to probably do best with uh, a hybrid. And yeah, there's a huge variety out there. Absolutely huge variety out there. And that will give you um, really good opportunities to grow. Ultimate Gardening is wondering, what's my favorite herb to grow? So my favorite is thyme. I use thyme and and just the the basic gardening time I, I have tried a couple different varieties um, but just just the, the basic common time is what you'll see it and so I grow it from seed and so I, I grow common time from seed and then I pot it up and then I put it in my garden and then it becomes a perennial herb in my garden so I love time because most of the I should say when I cook the herb I use most of the time tends to be thyme. I, I use thyme in a lot of sauces. I use thyme in a lot of dishes. And thyme not only tastes great when it's fresh, but it dries so well that I always have a canister of dried thyme. And because it handles my cold winter so well, every time I put a thyme plant in the ground, I know next year that plant will grow again. And so I've got time interspersed everywhere throughout my, my garden in a lot of different beds. And I harvest a bunch of it. I let it go to flower because it attracts beneficial insects. And I use it year round, either dried or fresh. Mostly dried just because I have so much dried time because I harvest so much time. But that's my favorite herb to grow and it does extremely well again back to that idea find what works best for you in your garden and then grow that time does great in my garden and so uh, i'm going to continue growing it as long as i garden i did start some creeping time from seed this year not for the purpose of using as uh, an herb in cooking but because uh, I've got a whole space in my garden I haven't developed yet where I'll be putting in a flagstone patio and I want to grow 
the creeping time in between those stones so that when you walk on the patio and you step on the thyme, you get that wonderful aroma, which is another reason I love thyme. Uh, so there you have it. I know, I know you're looking for ideas from a lot of us as to what to grow and what's best. And when it comes to herbs, um, I, I highly recommend thyme. Uh, oh, I see Kiri Nowak is joining with us today. One of our moderators just happens to be my daughter. My time didn't make it this year. Uh oh, she didn't share that with me. So uh, I, I'll, I've got some extra plants I'll share with you and you can have time growing. So uh, I'll, I'll get with Kiri after the show and make sure I get some of the, I still have some time in pots uh, because I'm spreading, continuing to plant it from seed into my garden by the pot process. Uh, under lights downstairs. So you'll you'll get some time, Kiri. I'll take care of you. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Yeah, Greg, uh, I completely agree with you. Um, I love eating nasturtiums. Nasturtiums are one of my favorite flowers to grow, and I'm not growing uh, nearly enough. I've got a couple nasturtiums in my garden right now. I mentioned before at the Galileo Garden in the, the big 42-foot greenhouse that I was growing in, I had nasturtiums growing at the entrance to both doors uh, for a number of reasons. Beautiful plant, wonderful flower. It's, it's a magnet plant for aphids. So when aphids come to the garden, they're typically going to attack the nasturtiums first. So you can see that you've got pests coming to your garden. They're not going to damage the plant to the point that it's going to kill it. Wonderful reasons to grow nasturtiums. But... The entire plant is edible from root to flower it's edible and i used to love one of one of the highlights of my gardening journey was to bring the students from the school into the greenhouse and they would walk through the door and there'd be these beautiful orange nasturtium flowers and i would stop and say hey grab a flower and they look at me and i kind of odd and they grab a flower and usually it would be groups of like four or five students and whichever one pulled the flower I'd say, pull off one of the petals and hand it to, to Josie. And someone else would uh, be there and like, what? And it's like, oh yeah, pick that flower and hand it over to Daisy. And oh, and pick another one of those petals and hand it over to Wyatt. And so then they'd be standing there. I'd say, now eat it. And they'd always hesitate, but they'd always eat it. And the petals of the nasturtium flower, I think are delicious. Uh, they, I think they tend to have a slight citrus flavor, but it's a peppery flavor. It's not so hot of a pepper that you immediately are overwhelmed. It's just a subtle pepper, and you're eating a flower, and especially for kids to eat flowers and recognize, again, back to the secret idea, the parts of the plant that you can eat that you're not thinking about. Uh, nasturtiums are ideal to grow in the garden for a number of reasons when it comes to insects, in particular, but eating nasturtiums, uh, if you are making a salad, if you're entertaining and you've got a beautiful garden fresh salad and you pick some nasturtiums and then either spread those petals as a garnish on your salad or just put the whole flower on the, the salad, you're gonna, you're gonna amaze your friends and family and it tastes delicious along the way. So thanks for pointing that out because that is another one of those wonderful plants to be growing. Uh, journey of involution to co-consciousness is saying planting some nasturtiums, marigolds, calendula, and starfire this evening when it cools. Good for you. Calendula is another great example of a flower that we grow for the insects. It's a, it's a wonderful plant and I'm growing calendula to attract those beneficial insects in my new uh, perennial garden area. Calendula is edible. So same thing. Take one of the calendula flowers and pull off the petals and sprinkle it as a garnish on the dish that you're making for dinner. So uh, great plant to grow. There's just so many out there. Uh, and so nasturtiums and calendula are high on my list of the edible flowers that really taste good and look great and, and both in the garden and on the plate. And they're also uh, doing a wonderful job for those uh, those insects that we're trying to attract. And Greg is saying nasturtiums and Johnny jump ups in fresh spring, spring rolls. Um, exactly right. Uh, violas, 
as is typically what the Johnny Jump Ups are. Another wonderful, usually a, a blue and white or purple and white flower, completely edible and a delicious thing to add variety to your menu. So see, you're wondering what today's video is going to be about, what the show was today when talking about gardening secrets. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And, and like I already mentioned earlier, it's, it's the different uses for the plants you're growing and the reasons why you're growing to, to attract insects or to eat or to just look at. All those reasons are different, but you can find a lot of those benefits in a single plant. And when you have a lot of those type of plants throughout your garden, then you're going to have a lot of that stuff happening, which is uh, just one of those things that I think makes gardening more enjoyable because every day brings a new experience and every day brings something that, that you can uh, find that you didn't know before. 6-6, six, six, red 6-6. Six, six. I've just gonna and had a nip or gone and had a nibble of some bright orange nasturtiums here in my garden. Leaf and petal, but I'm not too keen. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it, it might be an acquired flavor. The leaf is definitely more peppery than the flower but good i'm glad you did that because that that's exactly what we should be doing we should be trying some of these new things and you may discover something that you like or you may discover that it isn't something that you like but now six six red six six i suspect you're going to be sharing that idea with friends and family who are out in your garden let them taste the nasturtiums and see what they think about it because it might be something that uh is is a favorite for someone else. And so those kids I talked about at the Galileo School, the ones who would come out to the garden regularly knew that I always offered up nasturtium flowers. And some of them, that's the first thing they'd do. We'd be going to the greenhouse for a project. As they walked in the door, they'd grab a flower. And then as we're standing around the beds and we're talking about whatever it is we were talking about, they'd be snacking on a nasturtium flower. So not all the kids liked it, but some of them liked it enough that that was something they looked forward to when they came out to the greenhouse. So always, always a nice idea. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up we can answer. Um, yeah, and so Kevin raises a good point. Don't code nippling any poppies or angel trumpets. Uh, that's where the education part comes in. That's where the learning comes in. That's why I say... Um, learn about the plants you're growing and what parts are edible because there are plants in the garden that we shouldn't be eating because they can be toxic. Uh, rhubarb is a great example of that. Uh, people think rhubarb is poisonous, it's the leaves. It's not poisonous, it's to toxic. And so we will harvest rhubarb to eat the stalks, but you shouldn't eat the leaves because it can make you sick. You're, you're not going to die from eating a rhubarb leaf, but it can make you sick. But when it comes to Swiss chard, you can eat the stock and the leaf. And so I've known of I know, I've known gardeners who were growing Swiss chard thinking it was like rhubarb and they'd cut off the leaf and just eat the stock. Well, I prefer the rhubarb or the, um, the chard leaf over the stock. Now, typically I'll saute it all together, but I like the leaf better than the stock. So I appreciate you sharing that, Kevin, because there are some plants we shouldn't eat some parts of um, because it, it can make us sick. And once you learn the plants and what does well and what you like, then just keep growing. Okay, let's see. Um, Melissa's saying, I plan on freezing most of my tomatoes. A great way to preserve tomatoes. Tomatoes, I just love tomatoes. If you can grow them in your garden and depending on what time of year it is you're growing them like we were talking about. But tomatoes can be made into sauces. They can be made into salsa. You can eat them fresh. You can freeze them. You can dry them. Uh, there's just so many ways to preserve the tomatoes for later eating. And freezing is another, we'll call that another secret. Most of the people who are growing tomatoes will grow them for a sauce or a salsa. Very few are actually freezing them to use later. And you can freeze them and add them to sauces later on, or you can freeze them and use them in salads. Now the texture will change when they're frozen, but they're still flavorful and you'll still be able to use them. So good for you. I'm glad you're going to be freezing some of your tomatoes because that is a good way to preserve them. 
Okay, um, Taco Promotions is saying a wonderful amount of salvia. I love salvia. Another one of those plants that's uh, that's just excellent in the garden. Bees swarm it. I love salvia. So um, nice, soft. I, I haven't really done much with the leaves. I'll I'll eat a salvia flower from time to time. But thanks for sharing that. That's always a good idea. <clears throat> Isn't this wonderful that we can talk about all of this? Dusty Acres is saying my garden this year has been taken over with a water weed. Can one spray something in the garden to kill weeds without hurting my veggies? Um, yes, you can. Um, first off, you have to identify uh, what the pest might be and or what the weed might be because not every chemical is going to kill every pest or weed. And so, like for instance, if it's a water weed, um, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but if it's a grassy weed and you use a chemical like 2,4-D, the type of stuff you spray on your lawn to kill dandelions, well, that's a type of chemical that's used on broadleaf plants, broadleaf weeds. So if you use one of those lawn weed sprays, it might not kill what you have because it doesn't work on the plants like grass or corn, and but it will work on plants like tomatoes and lettuce. So you do have to be careful about the type of chemical that you might be using and make sure it is appropriate for that particular plant. And then when you do apply it, don't just spray. Don't spray the whole area, just apply it to the plants you're trying to kill. And to, to mean getting a paintbrush and taking some of that and literally painting the herbicide on the plant so it doesn't spray anywhere else in the garden. It doesn't go anywhere else other than the plant you're trying to kill. So yes, there is something that you can use to kill weeds, but I would target the weed and learn more about the herbicides you're using so that you're not inadvertently killing something else in your garden. It's it's never any fun, <clears throat> and we've talked about this recently. Leaf curling, uh, particularly in tomatoes, is a sign of herbicide contamination. And so if you live in an area with a lot of gardeners and you're not using herbicides, but you start seeing that your plants are suffering and you're getting some weird leaf curling, it could be that your neighbor was spraying an herbicide that blew into your garden and now it's affecting your plants. And the same thing can happen in your garden. If you spray one particular type of weed, don't be surprised if that spray doesn't blow into another area of your garden and start affecting. So that's why I say very precise application of herbicides is really what you're looking for and what you wanna to try to do. Okay, and before we get to the end and we start talking about the philosophy, one of the other things I wanted to talk about when it comes to gardening secrets is to explore non-traditional ways of gardening. And so particularly new gardeners, just starting out, <clears throat> those of us that maybe had somebody in our family who used to garden that we learned from when we were young, the traditional method of gardening is a nice flat area and you, you make rows in that flat area and then you plant your seeds in a row. And when you plant your seed, the seed packet is usually going to tell you how to grow the plant based on that traditional method, where you've got pathways between rows. And so the plants might only be six inches apart, but it suggests doing rows 24 inches apart because you've got to get in between the plants to harvest, to weed, to fertilize, whatever you're doing with those particular plants. You need space to get in there and that's what the seed packet's going to tell you. That's through the, the traditional way of gardening. Well, there are many other methods that can be more effective. You can grow more plants in a raised bed space if you grow all of the plants six inches apart without that 24 inch spacing. And so this is a secret. The seed packages give you bad information if you want to grow a lot of plants in a small area. Even in ground beds, you can plant more intensively. So instead of having a, a bed 
with one row of plants six inches apart, like beets, for instance, and then another row 24 inches apart, just do one block of your garden bed, be it in the ground or a raised bed, and put all the plants six inches apart, and they'll do fine. There's nothing wrong with modifying what a seed package tells you to do because they don't know your garden. They're just giving general information for gardeners everywhere who are going to buy their seed. And so they have to be a little vague. They have to assume the traditional method of spacing. You can do a non-traditional way of spacing and grow more plants. You can do vertical gardening. That's another thing when you talk about some of the spacing with melons and squashes, the vining plants. When you look at the seed packet, it will tell you to space some of those rows 36 inches apart. Well, that's to allow room for those vining plants to grow because a squash is going to spread out on the ground and you need to give it rooms to, to suck up the sun's energy and produce the fruit that you're trying to grow. But if you grow vertically up a trellis, like you pointed out behind me, if you look at a package of gourd seeds, it's probably going to tell you that those rows of gourds should be 36 inches apart. But when you look at what Brian did here in the straw bale, he probably put those gourd plants 12 to 18 inches apart. And now he's growing vertically. So instead of needing space on the ground to spread out, you're using space on the trellis to grow up. And that's a secret that many experienced gardeners have discovered. And again, it's really not a secret. It's just a piece of information that new gardeners haven't learned yet. And so as you think about fall gardening, as you think about next year's gardening, start thinking about trellises to grow vertically and start thinking about how you can plan out a garden bed to grow more plants closer together and learn why the seed packet is telling you what to do. And then also figure out how you can modify that to get more plants in your garden bed. So that's a big secret. But once you figure it out, you'll have some really good gardening success and a lot more harvest from the same amount of space in your bed. Okay, um, yeah, and um, Melissa raises a, a good point here. Uh, I never pay attention to packets outside of the days to harvest. And, and I tend to agree. <clears throat> I, after having grown so much for so many years, I pretty much know how deep the seed should be and the general spacing that it should be. But because I'm always trying new varieties each year, that's an important factor, the days to harvest. Is it going to be enough time in my growing season to grow that particular plant? And so many seed packets are just um, a dearth of information. There's just not enough information on the seed packet that you do have to learn from experience or look it up before you go out to plant. But almost every seed packet will tell the days to harvest, and that is a very important piece of information. So i um, glad that you shared that. And, and also, good for you, PD, growing zucchini plants um, as well. Uh, it says no zucchini, but the plant is growing fairly well. And so I'm glad you say that because that leads right into the philosophy that I wanted to bring up today. And uh, I was reminded of this by Garden Dilemma, who over the weekend reminded me that the hardest part of gardening is having patience. And so often we, we see the picture on the seed packet. We see what the fruit looks like in the catalog. We know the days to harvest. <clears throat> and so we put the seed in, we put the plant in, and then it's just not growing like we're expecting. And I get so many questions at this time of year asking why my cucumbers aren't growing, why my peppers aren't flowering, why my tomatoes aren't fruiting. And in many of the cases, the answer is have patience. Wait a week, wait two weeks. You should see the plant improve. If you're doing everything right, if you're doing all the stuff that I suggest, if you follow my videos and all those other great video channels that I recommend and you've got good soil and you put the plant in at the right time of year and you care for it with the 
the amount of sun that it's supposed to get because you put it in the right location and you keep the soil moist through watering, that plant is going to grow. Even when it's attacked by some pests, you deal with the pest, that plant will continue to grow. But this is another one of those fudging of truth and fact that you see on the seed packets. When it says 80 days to harvest, like I just pointed out, that's an important piece of information for me. 80 days to harvest means once the plant is actively growing in the ground and all of the conditions are right for that plant, you can expect a harvest in 80 days. But if the days are too cool or too hot, it's probably going to take longer than that. If the nighttime is too cool or too hot, it's probably going to take longer than that. If you go a few days without watering and it dries out, well, the plant's going to suffer a little bit. It's probably going to take longer than 80 days to reach that harvest. And so when things go perfectly, that number on the seed packet is what you can expect. But rarely, as you probably know, do things go perfectly in the garden. And so the plant will, go, will grow at different rates. And so like I talked about in the very beginning, I'm expecting this week to be a great week for my tomatoes. Two weeks ago and three weeks ago, the tomatoes were growing, but they weren't growing very quickly and they weren't putting many flowers on. Well, that's because it was extremely hot and the plants were suffering. When it's hot out, especially when it's very hot, the plants are going to stop growing. They, they essentially go dormant during the day because they're reserving all of their vital nutrients and all of the moisture within the plant during the day. It just stops and waits until things cool down again. Well, it may be a while before it cools down, and so the plant will grow, but it'll grow at night a little bit. Then when the conditions are right, it grows exactly the way you expect it to. That's where the patience comes in. It's so hard to look at a plant and you know it should be growing. And it's not. Have some patience. Give it a week. Give it two weeks. And you'll probably see improvement. 80 days hit and you're expecting a harvest. And there's no fruit ready to harvest. Have patience. Things probably weren't perfect. So you're going to need another week or two to get that harvest. It's, it's very normal for me, and I've mentioned this in other videos as well. I always add at least a two-week buffer when it comes to those dates. So on the front side where uh, it says I can put a plant out at uh, the last frost date or two weeks after the last frost date, I always wait another two weeks because I've got some patience, accepting that everything has to be perfect at that first last frost date. It's usually not, so I plan for an extra couple of weeks. The same on the back side. If it says it's an 80 day to harvest, I add two weeks. I figure it's gonna be at least 94 or 95 days until I get a harvest. And so like talking about the gourds earlier that are 100 to 120 days, everything has to be perfect in my garden for that to happen. Officially, when you look at the climatological data, my area has a 134 day long growing season. That's why I can try gourds perfectly from the beginning, perfectly to the end, 120 day gourd, giving myself an extra 14 days. I can do that in my 134 day growing season. But numbers of, year, of years, of seasons, of attempts, didn't work out because it didn't go right. Well, this is another part of patience. Have the patience to accept, well, it didn't go right this year, I'll try again next year. And you try it again next year, and hopefully it does work out. We just, so often we just chomp at the bit. We just wanna get out there. We want to harvest, everything's growing, nothing's happening right now, and we can't harvest anything. Have some patience, it'll all happen. That's one thing that just makes gardeners crazy people because we start doing something in March or April and we know 
if everything is perfect, we won't see literally the fruits of our labor until July or August. There aren't many other things we do in life where we know it's going to take that long for things to work out. We have to have patience. And the patience is what makes us all such special people. Because to be willing to do it year after year with all the things that go wrong, you just have to accept and be patient and know that you're going to learn something from all those mistakes. You're going to learn something. You're going to try something new. You're going to learn from that. And I'm, I'm at that point. That's why this resonated with me this, this weekend um, when Garden Dilemma brought it up in a comment that I'm, I'm becoming impatient. I want to harvest some tomatoes. The tomato plants are doing great. But I had a conversation with a family member a few days back where I said, you know, I've never harvested tomatoes in the middle of July. It just doesn't happen in my region because I typically am not putting them in the ground until the beginning of June. And there just aren't any 45-day tomatoes out there. And so while I see the plants, I just want to harvest. I'm trying to figure out what's going wrong with my tomatoes. Why can't I harvest? I just have to look at the calendar and realize it's too early. I need to be patient. It's another month for me before I should expect to have tomatoes. But oh man, it's just, I see them forming and I know it's getting close. And when the fruit turns green, it becomes even worse. When you have a, a, a green pepper or a green tomato and you're waiting for it to change color, when you have that melon, when you've got that pumpkin and you're waiting for it to change color, it seems to take forever. That's normal. That's the way the plant works. Pumpkins will not continue expanding and getting much bigger once they form that beautiful orange color. Those plants are getting bigger while they're still green. And so with your melons and your squashes and your tomatoes, except that you want them to be green for a long period of time so that they'll grow as big as possible. Then when they change color and they start to mature, they're not getting much bigger past that point. And so that's where you can reward yourself for the patience that you've had. Don't try to force your plants to harvest too soon because it's, it's going to be um, the results aren't going to be what you're expecting. Instead, have the patience. Expect that it's going to be longer than you want, but that's okay because the plant is still growing during that entire time and the outcome will be that beautiful red or purple or striped tomato that you harvest and get to enjoy the flavor. It's going to be that orange or red or purple or yellow sweet bell pepper. It's going to be one of those speckled melons or striped melons. That's the end result. If you can just wait a little bit, Deal with the weeds, deal with the pests, deal with building new beds, deal with coming up with a new plan, like for fall planting, while the plants are doing their thing, while they're maturing, have patience, and then reap the benefits of all the effort that you have done up to that point. So there you have it. Patience is a virtue when it comes to gardening because you won't tear your hair out and go crazy waiting for something to happen that's not going to happen until it's the right time based on the plant's schedule, not your schedule. And too often, they don't match up. So even those of us that profess something along the lines of be patient, I have the problem as well. And I'm not always as patient as I would like to be, but I take a deep breath and just enjoy the garden space and know that there's always something that I can work on or harvest <clears throat> and have some fun with. So glad to see you here on this Monday. I look forward to having you here next Monday. It's always a good time to share with you. I'm going right out to the garden, going to do a lot of weeding today. I'm going to be trellising my tomatoes. I trellised, well, the tomatoes are on trellises. I tied them up. I put some tomato clips around uh, last weekend and they're growing so good. I've got to put new clips on 
to direct the growth up the trellis because they've done so well this last week. So it was a month before I did any trellising, clipping of the tomatoes, and now I'm doing it again in just a week's period. So there's a, an example of how fast things can happen once the plant kicks in and once the conditions are right. So that's gonna keep me busy today. I hope you have some good projects planned in your garden over the next week. And I look forward to you sharing with us next Monday what you've done in the garden and how good your gardening week was. Thanks so much for being here today. And I look forward to the time, same time, same channel, same day next week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.